Hello, I'm Dawn Durham and welcome to Patent Pod. Today we're joined by Dr. Bill Heward and Dr. Janet Twyman. Thank you both for being here today with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's our a pleasure. It's a pleasure, Don. <laughs> Thank you for having us. We want to talk today about active student responding. So when we think about tactics to increase active student responding, we have those high-tech options and low-tech options. And we know that there are effective strategies or, or techniques to increase our response from our students. Particularly, um, the low-tech options are very effective. But yet we don't see a lot of adoption of these techniques in the classroom. Why do you think that is? Is it a matter of the teachers don't know? Or is it a matter of they feel too good to be true? What do you think? I think a big part is teachers don't know. Okay. Um, uh, many times I've had the experience of sharing these, whether it's in a university class or an in-service training workshop opportunity, mm -hmm. with teachers, uh, both fairly young in their career and experienced teachers. And where has this stuff been? Um, I, I think these strategies are more likely to be in the repertoire and awareness of um, special education teachers than they are okay. general education teachers. Uh, part of that is, uh, I, I think, no doubt, a uh, kind of some different ideologies that are common. And with mm -hmm. um, uh, many general education teachers um, who work so hard and care so much for their students and have so much content knowledge um, in many aspects of education are very skilled in, but for many, sadly, their teacher training did not mm. include science-based uh, methods of systematic explicit instruction, of which methods for increasing student engagement, active student responding is just one part, an important part. But I think your question could be even broader to the point of um, just why don't we see more use mm. of um, science-based uh, methods for uh, in increasing learning in the classroom? Yeah, I would love to chime in on that too. Um, all the reasons that Bill mentioned, but also um, we need, of course, we need teacher pre service to teach mm. about science based <coughs> methods, but we also need that classroom environment, the school environment to kind of support those mm. methods. We mm. need, you know, colleagues and administrators to kind of to help teachers know about the strategies, feel comfortable using them. Um, teachers, of course, we want them reinforced by student learning, but also, you know, other attention and approval mm -hmm. for using those types of practices. Um, I had the great fortune of working with um, one of the U.S. territories with all of the teachers in, a, in um, hundreds of teachers in the district in a U.S. territory, and they hadn't heard of many evidence-based practices, definitely hmm. not active student responding, and they were very excited to learn about this procedure, loved it in the professional development, but then when we went to do classroom follow-up and classroom observation, not many of them were using the procedures, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why? And, um, and talking with the teachers and talking why, um, you know, they just didn't quite feel like it was, they didn't feel like they were gonna be good enough at it, so they were afraid to try, mm -hmm. even though it's super easy. And so this is why I'm bringing in, you know, the environment needs to support the practices as well, because we just did, in situ mm -hmm. practicing with their kids yeah. and they got it and they were off so so when we think about some of the hardest pieces or, or what we perceive to be some of the hardest pieces of implementing these student responses and being active and engaged one of the reasons you're seeing is, is perhaps teachers aren't feeling comfortable with using it and confident that they themselves know how to use it and and is it just a matter of coaching them through that to, to kind of overcome that hurdle or what should we be thinking about to overcome that perceived hurdle well, um, these really are super easy strategies. I mean, they do yeah. require you know planning yeah. and thinking and knowledge and instruction. They're super easy. I think you just got to do it. And I think it's for some teachers, it's just been that first step of doing it, mm -hmm. um, you know, get, getting it going. And then I think they learn, you know. Okay. I think secondary teachers uh, are sometimes a little more resident uh, um, to. Uh, you know, I read a, to turn over my to turn over the class to the kids. Mm. You know, we have this yeah. whole uh, kind of history of liking, <laughs> and there's nothing not to like about a, students being uh, nice and on task and well behaved and, and quiet. But affecting te teaching is a lot more than having students that are you know be still, be quiet, be docile, sure. you know, be active and, and, and learn. 
but uh, you know now I have a, a class of uh, 20, 25, you know, 30 high school students in uh, in American history, and all of a sudden I'm going to have them, you know, all calling out answers and responding. So part of it is, uh, you know, so Janet was saying having support by the school leadership and your mm -hmm. principal and your teacher supervisor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try something new. Uh, it's yeah. going to take a little while to get it up and running as, as well as we can. We'd like, you know, we need your support with it. Um, yeah. But the too good to be true is an interesting kind of question and angle to think about this. Uh, it is good and it is true. Um, it's completely true. Um, <laughs> and but very these, good. <laughs> yeah, but these strategies, you know, they're not, um, they're not the solution to all mm -hmm. aspects of, of effective teaching and, and classroom management or, or any of that. But as far as a... Um, an alterable variable. You know, Benjamin Bloom, our, the Benjamin Bloom of uh, famous uh, scaffolding of, uh, mm -hmm. of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think one of his uh, most fantastic um, publications, a brief little paper years ago in Fidel de Kappa called Al Alterable Variables. Mm -hmm. He simply said the most effective teachers focus on an alterable variable, which is what? One, something that makes a difference in student learning, and equally important, something the teacher can control. Mm -hmm. And that's, that fits in with these strategies for increasing uh, active student responding during instruction, whatever size group, whatever mm -hmm. the placement, whatever the curriculum content is. Uh, the research is clear, both from general and special ed researchers, both from the single subject uh, uh, tradition uh, of research, as well as uh, uh, statistical comparison uh, tests that may be the most re robust finding in educational research, all mm -hmm. other variables being equal. Um, when students make many responses in a lesson, they learn more than when they make fewer uh, responses. And so now we have some tools that have proven to be um, uh, applicable across curriculum, across learners, across settings. And, and so I think uh, any effort we can do to help um, future teachers to acquire uh, basic uh, mm -hmm. knowledge and successful experience in, uh, in, in student teaching and so forth. But then especially uh, when I'm in the classroom, mm -hmm. in the schools, to have support, both uh, administrative support, collegial support, and mm -hmm. you know, you said it, the coaching is so so vital. So vital. You know, you talked about kind of this transcends curriculums, subject matters, grade level, grade sizes, classroom sizes. Are there any special considerations when we think about implementing strategies and techniques such as these with unique learners, such as students with autism? Anything that we have to be considerate of? Uh, sure, I'll jump in <laughs> first or whatever. Um, oh man, I hate to be one of those people that do a yes and no answer. Um, in, in general, I will say no in as much as we look at every learner as an individual, mm -hmm. right? And so, I, true, you know, yeah. autism or whatever, I'm going to look at all of my learners and see what I might need to do with these strategies to make sure that they're the most effective they can be for, you know, for all learners. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the, the um, no, not just for mm -hmm. autism, mm -hmm. for everyone answer. The yes answer comes from in terms of, um, uh, you know, these strategies are, f are great. They are ways of delivering instruction, mm -hmm. but you still need to make sure that your instruction's good. You could ask 100 choral responding, but mm. if it's not about relevant material or What's brings the in point? content. Sure. Right, so I, you know, I think yeah. that those are all important variables. Yeah. And incorporating a student with special needs, is that whether it's uh, autism spectrum disorders, intellectual disabilities, uh, a sensory a impairment, um, a, a skilled educator, a good educator, it is going to individualize. Mm -hmm. How do I adapt or adopt um, mm -hmm. the activity, both the technological aspect, whether it's a card we're holding up or a, a mobile device we're using, a, an app, in this setting with this group of students where the student can be, um, not just participate, not just be there in, uh, you know, in body, but really part of the, uh, the, the social and academic uh, in, uh, fabric and engagement of, uh, of the lesson. So almost like back to basics, uh, task analysis, what's involved in, for example, participating effectively as any mm -hmm. student mm -hmm. um, in a teacher-led choral response activity? I have to learn to discriminate teacher signals. 
uh, I have to learn, for example, when to respond, when it's a group response, when it's an individual response. Um, those I, I, I have to learn sometimes, when do I raise my hand? What are ways to get the teacher's mm -hmm. lesson? There's not enough yet research. There's only the beginnings of research exploring those exact questions and how to do it. We know we can do it uh, because of so many other marvelous things that people with disabilities today can do mm -hmm. that were thought mm -hmm. previously, well, I'm not going to be able to, to learn to do that. Are, are you kidding? So when we do a task and we look at what's involved in participating effectively in a group lesson, there's nothing about those requirements or what a student with autism will bring to the classroom in terms of uh, prerequisite skills, it doesn't mean we can't do that. So when we think about eliciting more active student responses from students, we're really talking about being inclusive and equitable in our practice mm -hmm. for all students. Yes, mm -hmm. we are. Because as you had said, every student is essentially a unique learner in right. some way, shape, or form. They're all unique and individualized. So I think that's right. a key piece, and I, I so appreciate that. I want to ask you, and this is something that we focus on at Pat and Pod. We want those who are out there listening and viewing this episode to really grow professionally. We want them to look at their career path and their knowledge base and say, I wonder if there are some areas perhaps I can get a little bit more about. What advice might you offer to those who are viewing or listening this episode in regards to how they should be growing professionally? What can you offer to those folks? Around active student responding? A around anything you want, but active student responding would be great. <laughs> Google active student responding in Heward. <laughs> <laughs> got it, Please got it. Know. Active student responding in Heward, <laughs> yes. And you're going to have a wealth of, of resources and how-to mm, guides. Good to know. And there, and research and ideas for future research. And good. so in terms of professional development that way, I'm serious, that is one way to find a treasure trove. Google active student responses in Heward. We yes. will all be doing that now. Oh yes. my. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first time we try any new lesson, it doesn't hurt to stand in front of the mirror at home and mm. do a little practice uh, yourself. No matter how simple the, uh, the content might be in terms of the, uh, the teacher's knowledge of it and presenting of it, if, I'm, if I've not prepared mm. initially to be able to present the material fluently and I have to kind of waste time, what, what, what's my next question? What's my, when I have it all prepared and I practiced a little bit, mm -hmm. yes, I'm talking about scripting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm then not just able to present the material at a better pace, I'm not using 90%, in my case, limited brain power. What am I going to do <laughs> next? I've got all that planned out. Mm -hmm. I can focus on my students. Yeah. And are they responding? Mm -hmm. Are they getting them correct? Am I, uh, am I providing useful feedback to them? And that's where you want to be, not scrambling. Well, what's the next question? What's the next thing I'm, I'm presenting? So uh, I, I, think, uh, I think preparation. So doing a little pre-planning really up front really saves you for instruction. Yeah, when you're in exactly, front of the students yeah. and being able to yeah. respond and provide feedback and, and formal, informally assess what's going on with your students. So I think that is a, a key piece that we, we think of, but perhaps we're not all doing. And this might be a no-brainer, but just to chime in on that. Please. If you're thinking about the digital technologies mm. or the high tech, which we're loosely calling, of, of active student responding, like I said, it may be a no-brainer, but practice that technology oh, yeah. before you get out in front of your students. Make sure that you know how it works. Mm -hmm. You know, you understand all the various features. Like, don't let the first time you use it be in front of a crowd. So, uh, I think that's yeah. good advice for everything yeah. that we do. <laughs> Anytime there's technology involved, <laughs> practice it. Make sure it works beforehand. Get a good sense for it before. So that, again, your focus is on the kids, yeah. and that's yeah. where it should be. Yeah. So I think that's good, good advice. So thank you so much for that. Thank mm -hmm. you both, Bajan and Bill, for stopping by Pat and Pod today. We're so glad that you did, and we hope you enjoyed your time here, and maybe you'll visit us again. We yeah. would love it. That's great. Thank Yay. you, Dawn. Thanks, thank you Dawn. to all of you in the field. You inspire educational growth in your students every day. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Patent Pod.